Welcome back to Vaulted by Proof. On this episode, we take a look at the digital art landscape through the purview and the perspective of Ben Roy. One quote unquote problem, it's just overhang from speculation. Like it's kind of a hangover of this insane euphoria that we went through. And then we also talk to CJ, otherwise known as Raven, an artist, engineer, and collector, and has a very unique perspective on the digital art space right now. I'm hoping we're nearing a bottom and we can build from here, but it's going to be completely different than 2021. We also look at four or five artworks and artists that I've not seen before. And so it's a great conversation and a great opportunity to discover new artists. Let's get into it. Welcome to Vaulted by Proof. I'm Eli Steinman, Director of Art at Proof and Yuga Labs. This is a show about collecting and creating digital art. And we have two wonderful guests across the entire sphere of the collecting and creating, and in this case, also investing part of the landscape. First, we have Ben Roy. Really an honor to have you on the show, Ben. You are the co-founder of Accelerate Art, of course, a writer, prolific, in fact, as a writer and the uh, host of the Liquid Culture podcast. Great to have you here, Ben. Thanks so much, Eli. Yeah, stoked to be here. All right. And then, of course, we have back again, Raven, CJ, artist, engineer, collector, podcast host. CJ, what do you not do? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Ask me again next week. There'll probably be something else. So, yeah. I love it. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, and CJ, I think you mentioned, uh, I hope I'm not spoiling anything, but in MARPA during the Art Blocks weekend, uh, this coming year, November, you'll be doing a whole bunch of media. So very excited to see that. Yeah, we'll be announcing that soon. So yeah, nice. for sure. But uh, yeah, we got some MARPA plans in the works and uh, it's going to be a great weekend for anybody who comes it. out. And we're going to have we're gonna have coverage, like you said. So we'll have, we'll have some stuff for people that are going to be at home. Pumped. And Ben, will you be there? I hope you will. Yeah, right? I'll be at Marfa. Yes, oh, yeah. I'm excited. It's like my favorite thing all year in, in this whole circuit. I love it, man. Well, I'm excited for that. Let's jump in. So this is a show about collecting and creating art, as I said. Ben, let's go to you first. Uh, share something that you collected recently. You previewed this uh, for us just a moment ago. Super cool piece. Uh, what do you have? Yeah, one second. Let me grab this. Yeah. Um, so I minted this on the weekend. Let me just confirm that you guys can see what I'm looking at on my screen. Um, yeah. So this is a, a veil of frequencies drop. This was on base. FX hash kind of recently moved over to base and I started doing work there. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to get back in the flow of minting stuff for cheap, trying to do, you know, do something every other day, basically, um, on chain. And before it was cool, I will, I will say like my family got really into Japanese, like Zen garden stuff when I was a kid. Mm. So this is like late nineties, that kind of era. And yeah, this just kind of reminded me of that. And so I felt some nostalgia minted a few, uh, this was probably my favorite representation of that. And yeah, not too much more to add on that. Just uh, thought it was a super fun FX hash drop. I love it. You said FX hash moved to base. Yeah. So this was on base. Um, the, I don't remember the exact day or, or whatever, where they, they kind of shifted over. Um, but they're trying to make it more successful, more accessible rather than uh, just kind of Tezos mints as far as I understand. And so, right. yeah, there's now collections that you can mint there in ETH land. Um, and we'll see, yeah. we'll see how that goes. Cool. Okay. I, I remember oh, that, awesome. of course, they moved over to ETH L1 or, or, or incorporated ETH L1 a number of months ago. Cool to see that they're also adding base support now as well. And love this piece. Love the story behind it. Um, CJ, let me come over to you. You are one of the collectors sure. I admire most. Um, yeah. Thank you. Not to denigrate hey, your we, choice, Ben. That was a great suggestion. Great uh, share. No worries. CJ, After what we do talk you have? about, you know, FX hash moving to base, uh, you know, I got, I got a piece I'm sharing from FX hash on, mm. uh, on Tezos. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Let's so this see. is a piece I recently collected. Um, it's called reading a book from 2021. It's a output by a generative algorithm by Kim 
Ansdorf, who is, you know, he's behind Cargo. He's a Grails artist, uh, yeah. just an OG generative artist, has a very distinct style here. This is, a, you know, a looping piece that just continues to loop. I could totally see. Um, I haven't put it on a wall yet, but this is something mm. that, like, for, for you know, the, the numerous uh, of these apps that are coming out now that to display yeah. NFTs on TVs and things like that. Like, this is a piece that I think is, like, perfect for that to just have up in your house in, and even, you know, potentially, hopefully, maybe we'll have some good options for, like, square displays. Um, mm -hmm. I think this would be a cool to keep it in a square uh, form factor, but it's, it's great. Like, I really enjoy it. So it's classic, it, his stuff. Love I it. love it. It, it, this isn't a new piece though, right? Um, no, CJ? it's from 2021. He released a series on, on FX hash. So it, and you, it. were you just digging in the crates yeah. of his work and, and you found I was. it? I found it. Yeah, exactly. And this one I particularly liked. I saw it was like right on the floor and I was like, wow, this one is actually pretty special. Um, and so Love I picked it. it up and I, when I shared it on X, it's, it's one of the biggest engagements as far as like the amount of likes and things like that, that I got like of any work from my collection that I've, I've shared. So it's Love clear it. that at least, you know, people in, in, you know, that collect digital art really, uh, it resonates with them as well. So it wasn't just me. Love it. I, I've been watching his cargo collection very closely right now. I think the floor is around 0.8 or so. Um, there are, there's like probably five or six or seven collections that yeah. uh, were released over the last couple of years that I've been watching very closely and cargo is one of them. Uh, yeah. I don't have one. So, so hoping to go pick one up. I don't have one either. I and I, I, I needed to get some exposure to Kim because he's such a great yeah. artist and uh, yeah, cargo. I, I, I kind of missed the min. I, I was paying attention to it. I, I threw a bunch of bids at like the 0.5 range, but then it kind of went over one and um, maybe one day, you know, I'll get, I'll get back into it or, or I'll get into it, but uh, it just yeah. kind of has been moving away from me when I've tried to pick one up. So, um, yes. but always yeah, it's a great series, man. I love that, that share CJ Kim is one of the absolute best. I have one of his pixel sorting pieces also on Tezos, huge Kim fan. Of course, I wanted to share one piece that I recently collected. It was actually this morning from OX. Uh, I think you say, OX deed did, I'm not sure if you guys are, are familiar with him. Um, yep. He recently released this collection, Machine and the Ghost, which I also minted yes. one of. I went through his his catalog in the same way perhaps you did with Kim. Um, yep. that you mentioned CJ, and I found this one of one piece that just really resonated with, with me. Love it, aesthetically, composition, colors, uh, and it's on chain. It's part of this one of one collection called Digital Therapy. So was able to trade with the, the collector who owned it this morning, wanted to share this. He's doing great work and uh, it's always fun to collect something new and when it's fresh, share it. So uh, want to get that out there, love it. Um, but let's move Beautiful. on. Let, let, let's, let's go into now the, the, the meat of the show. We have Ben Roy here, who's you know one of the absolute best early stage investors. You have such a good purview, Ben, of everything happening. Um, in, in the digital art space. So I'm curious for both of you and starting with you, Ben, what feels like is it's most fundamentally broken? And that could be from sort of the, something on the collector side or perhaps something with the platform economic side. What is the sort of most acute broken element in your view in the digital art landscape at the moment that's maybe serving as a really significant impediment and roadblock to to really good progress? Yeah, that's a good question, man. I think I would reach for something that's more uh, narrative driven than anything like mechanical or technical. So it's just overhang from speculation. Like it's kind of a hangover of this insane euphoria that we went through. And I think expectations are pretty um, shaped by that still. Like there's a lot of artists who think they need to make an enormous amount of money to be successful. Collectors are hoping stuff goes up, you know, incredible multiples instantly. And so when you're, yeah, when you're in that kind of die off phase of post 2021, 2022, um, there just isn't as much 
uh, organic excitement. I think the people who are around digital art still love it. I mean, like obviously this show is a good example of that, right? Um, there's so many cool things going on kind of underground or behind the scenes, but yeah, if I had to pick kind of one quote unquote problem, it's just that mm. the whole uh, slice of the industry is kind of still dealing with a bit of that hangover. I'm not sure yeah. if you guys also see that. No, that is such a good call out. And I, I think the way that you're, you know, you went to a narrative as the the thing that is is this wrapper around the entirety of the digital art landscape in many ways, rather than something very specific and man, mechanical, is is you know really cool and well said. CJ, what do you think? I agree with Ben 100. percent I think you know 2021 was crazy, as we all know. It's it was speculation. It came, a lot of good things came out of 2021, but also a lot of bad things. You know, we, I think we all knew it was unsustainable, right? Um, and, you know, now we're on the tail end of that and kind of we're out of the, the crazy <laughs> phase of that. And now we've gone through the bear market. I think, you know, I, I'm hopeful that people are getting more realistic. I think people yeah. are a lot of the, a lot of the 2021 crowd has left or has lost interest if they weren't here for the art. So I'm hoping we're nearing a bottom and we can build from here, but it's going to be completely different than 2021. We're not going back there, I don't think, um, at least in the near term. Uh, so, you know, it's sobering and we have to figure out, okay, what does it mean to build in this environment and the environment coming up? Um, as far as, you know, impediments that I would say, one of them is just that I think there is still an echo chamber between you know digital art collectors and um, fine art collectors, and I think there's a pretty big chasm between those two that we still need to kind of um, smooth over. And I think we're talking a different language, and you know sometimes it's 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 you know um, this it's the communication between those two groups of people are is not the best. So we need to move more into that space, I think, and, and, uh, but also be opening, open to hear from, you know, more of the traditional side of things as well. So it, it needs to be a collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Ben, coming back over to you, what are you seeing, um, you know, maybe at the early stage investing, um, a moment, of course you're at seed club as well, and you're seeing a lot of deal flow, I imagine, um, it, within the digital art sphere, that maybe gives you some hope and you see some promise or some energy around resolving some of these things we're talking about? Yeah, good question. I think um, what I would point to is just a, a bigger emphasis on community building and community design. Like you see a lot of the euphoria that we're talking about, right? And then prices go up and people wanna come in and make money and it's less about the art and more about the underlying kind of object that you can just sell higher. Um, I think a lot of the startups, at least that I've seen in kind of the art side of the space, are really trying to focus on how do we build relationships with people that actually want to collect art, right? Something like mm -hmm. Click Create isn't a, a startup per se, but they do, they're do they a good example of this, I think. People who are just building long-form community. Um, Ensemble is another one that you guys are, are familiar with as well. I think it's kind of how do you make an effort to really build relationships of depth with people? Um, over time so that whatever the collecting format looks like people are just excited they're still there they're they're ready to kind of go to bat for these artists um mm. and yeah so i think emphasis on community and that like long form uh relationship building uh seems to be one of the edges that i'm seeing love that and and then babe ben staying with you maybe for a moment um and i know you've done some writing on this and some thinking and cj i'm sure you have as well um do you think there's room for consu so-called consumer crypto, wh whatever that might mean to, to both of you, uh, for digital artists and in the digital art sphere? Um, you know, we, we've seen Rodeo, we've seen Zora, of course, um, implement these different models where there's uh, each work that an artist produces is less precious and it's actually about frequent minting and very inexpensive minting and, and this cadence of showing up to your point, Ben, all the time, every day, multiple times a day to participate on chain. I'm curious yeah. though, in, in my view, that, that those models are actually a little bit better suited for creators, let's say uh, food bloggers or travel um, creators, for example, perhaps and not uh, as well suited for artists. Ben, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think um, I think that hits the nail on the head. I what I like about these kind of apps is it normalizes the concept of minting, which at the end of the day I think is going to be a behavior that we all see a lot of over the next you know five ten plus years. Um, but I also agree. I think it's more kind of a social behavior, and it's it's an interesting problem for artists to to wrestle with, right? Like, do they mint there? How do you build visibility through that kind of work, but also kind of keep your your precious work for other platforms potentially? Um, but yeah, not not too much to add. I'm, I'm curious, maybe what CJ would uh, add there. Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. The you know, and it's something that more and more, I'd say, even in the last couple months, I've been kind of torn myself on is that, you know, because I, I actually have seen more, more legs on the high end of the market, like, which I didn't see a couple months ago. I think some serious museums have been collecting some of, um, some top works, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. with, with Tyler Hobbs and, you know, um, at least on the generative side, I've seen, you know, a number, but also not just the generative side, regular digital art as well. One of ones, um, I, I am actually more, I feel better, I guess, on the, on the kind of fine art side of the market. Um, so for those type of artists, I, I kind of agree that, um, I don't think it makes sense to go right now and do, you know, some crazy, uh, you know, like really low cost edition or something like that. Like, I think there is definitely ways to, th that those artists can continue to build momentum on that side and to try to get into more of the, mm -hmm. uh, art fairs and things like that, that, that really run the, in where the money really changes hands in the traditional art world and to yeah. push in that direction. But I think a, a lot of the other, maybe the artists that, that aren't on that tier, I think there is opportunity because, and I think they have an important job because we, we just, I think one of the biggest opportunities is just new collectors, right? We need to get new collectors in here. Um, and I've said that last time I was on this, and I think these, yeah. these type of apps drive towards that, right? And I think if mm -hmm. we don't have new blood, new collecting, and there is so much opportunity for people that would never even consider collecting art before yeah. out there yeah. that these that these apps low low cost mints and things like that can drive adoption and get people interested in collecting when they would have never been interested so i don't think it's just oh we got to get the 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 money from the traditional art collecting world right there's a ton there's a sea of people out there that i think we can go and evangelize and and uh, turn them on to to art yeah. collecting in general right yeah yeah, I mean, I think we're, uh, th that's the big open question, CJ, is do we ultimately see that funnel down to those artists, potentially sort of higher value works so that an artist can have a real career, a real income, and that's their top of funnel, community building and awareness. Um, I'm hoping to have both uh, Kayvon and Jacob from, from Rodeo and Zora on shortly so that we unpack that even more. Um, I want to sort of segue just a little bit and show this chart um, that many will know, and I know you two certainly do. Let me just pull it up here. Um, this is something that BATS shared, I think, all the way back 2021. And you can see that, you know, this NFT money flow chart, there is not this layer above collectibles called consumer crypto or, or the thing we're talking through and describing right now. Um, I wonder, as we look at this now, not only that potentially sort of hypothetical, very top layer where due diligence is very easy and time investment is very low and, and expenditure of money is very low at the very top. Um, are there, is there an element there that you think, you know, we could probably slide in here in retrospect? And are there other elements here that, that maybe Ben, starting with you, you think either do hold up still very well or perhaps uh, you you would reconstruct a little bit. Yeah, good good questions, man. I think uh, this is a deep cut. This chart I haven't thought about this chart in a long time. Um, <laughs> I think it's a good call out. I think maybe if we were to reorganize the pyramid a bit, these like open apps might be the funnel at the top. Like you get people yeah. who are new, right? Like CJ was saying, they might mint something for the first time ever, and it's less than a cent. They they get that behavior in them. 
Um, and then you can kind of move down the pyramid to collectibles or, or generative art. And I, and I guess one of one's there at the bottom. Um, so I think of it like less in terms of, hey, is this stuff going to be super valuable? You know, maybe an artist might decide that that's their playbook, right? To, to open a new career, they're going to go really broad, right? And just try and become a medic and, and viral and, and that kind of thing. Um, but other people might just use it as a funnel to kind of direct folks to their other work. Um, so yeah, I, would, I, I think this still holds up. Um, but yeah, curious what you would add there, CJ. Yeah, I think one of the things I just have to, I always think of when I think of this though, is like my, my, the voice in my head says it is, is Andy Warhol because he, he, the one thing is when you think of Andy Warhol, you know, how much, you know, work he put out and how much, you know, of, you know, mass produced work he put out. And yet it's now so valuable. So it's it's kind of the the antithesis to this thesis, right? Yeah. <laughs> In a way. So it's he, he I don't think that though, plays out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, DJ. He would be though like the outlier outlier, right? Yeah. Exactly. So I, I just think so that that kind of but artists got to decide their own their own future. Right. And, and the way they want to navigate the market and create. And I think yeah. they got to go with their gut on that. And that's the most important thing. Yeah. And, and I'll just call out one other thing. You know, this was 2021. You can see that AI art is not represented here at all. And I think, you know, the reason yeah. I call that out is that only in a couple of years, have these primary tranches evolved already that much. We're like, you know, AI art, if we were to reconstruct this today, would be, you know, very much one of these tranches, maybe in that sort of generative bucket, um, we would add it there in a very real way. Um, so, and we would also update probably the platforms that are called out at the bottom uh, in some ways, async, for example, being in 2021, one of the critical platforms still, of course, great contributions, um, but but less present in in today's minting and art creation environment. Um, related to this chart, at the very top, we see punks far left um, in that collectibles, and you can argue collectibles art with punks, of course. Ben, you had this or have this, um, you know, great uh, essay, the the fat crypto punks thesis. Give us like the the TLDR on that thinking that you had and that you articulated. And then similar to the way that we deconstructed this chart for a moment, would you update your thinking uh, if you were to go back and, and re-articulate that today? Yeah, good question. I think, um, so back in 2021, uh, a lot of people kind of were, were circling around CryptoPunks. This is maybe Q1 2021. And um, I think this concept of a fat CryptoPunks thesis comes from uh, the fat protocol thesis, which is a kind of nerdy crypto essay that uh, Joel Manegro from Placeholder wrote, which is like value is going to accrue to this one particular layer in the stack. Um, I guess we don't we don't need to nerd out too much more more than that. And so a couple people made that observation that, hey, maybe punks are going to be um, this core asset, right? If, if digital art grows and, and kind of culture on blockchains grow, um, I think a lot of value is going to flow to punks potentially. Um, and so, yeah, in, in that 2021 era, I kind of took some of the thinking from kind of the OG people who've been around for a few years before me, um, added a few things and, and kind of came up with this essay. And I think like the long story short is I think it holds up to an extent um, and there's some things I would change. Uh, I'd be curious for you guys to weigh in as well. Um, but what I what I still like about it is I still think punks matter. I still think there are certain historic collections that in, in my view will collect value and, and hold value and grow in value over time. Excuse me, as more people uh, kind of experiment with owning things on blockchains. Uh, I mm -hmm. think one thing I would change about that is just having a bit more of an expansive view of where value could flow, right? Because there's a lot of artists that are that are maybe newer that also have a very strong case for uh, their work. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'll pause there. Um, it was a fun thing to write, um, but yeah, just always funny to go back and reread your own writing, you know. Ben, what are those? Just quickly, what are those vectors of uh, that that construct value in your mind? Is it uh, and you sort of alluded to a few, is it historical significance? Is it um, date of release? What are the couple elements that, that come together? Um, you know, of course, our friend Derek has this notion of no external dependencies. Like, what are the things that are, you think come together to create value in that way? 
It's a good question. I think for punks specifically, it's actually less any single input and more what they represent together. Um, mm. So, you know, there's going to be people that would point out that there were other NFT collections before punks and that would be correct. Um, there's going to be people that, you know, say, you know, this collection did something else better. Or this collection also had a marketplace and so on and so forth. But I think why punks are interesting and why value flows to them in my mind is they, A, like represent a moment in time that packaged all of those things together. Mm. Um, and actually, maybe I'll just leave it, leave it as that point. Like you have the NFTs yeah. themselves, you have the networked idea of them, like 10,000 pieces together that kind of inform a lot of other things down, down the line. Um, you have this built-in marketplace. You have a lot of what represents crypto and crypto art packaged into a single spot. And so I think that's kind of what drives value to them ultimately. I love that. Great distillation. I know you were watching the, the time and sort of bring it all together like that is impressive. Um, let's transition into the vaulted section of the show. This is where we get to go into your collections at the top of the show. We looked at something very recent that you'd both collected. Let's now um, track into your vaults and look at a piece or a collection each. CJ, let me start with you. Um, as we go digging in your vault, and I know it's expansive, uh, mm -hmm. what did you come up with and what do you want to share? Sure. So I want to share a piece I collected a while ago. I don't know, maybe it could have been 2021. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it was 2021. Um, and this is this is a piece by, uh, it's a generative piece, one of one by, um, it's actually not a one of one, it's a small series. Uh, I think there is three of these um, yeah. by Jimmy Herdberg, who's an art blocks artist. And I just love, I have it printed on my wall. I, I love this piece. Um, it's just so, so much detail and right. such, it's really great for a generative piece. And also like he made it figurative. Like I see two heads here, like in this right. almost like brain, like neurons type of uh, composition and the colors are just great. It's just a piece that I really enjoy and some one that I like will never get rid of. And um, I, I just, love it. you know, having met Jimmy and, and, you know, counting him as a friend as well, just sweetens it, but it's really, uh, it's, it's a special piece for me. CJ, how do you decide what to, we talked about it. You have a huge collection. How do you decide what to print and, and have a physical of around you? I mean, we can look at your background. I see, I yep. think a Meridian book. I see a Dimitri Cherniak, the Squiggle. Uh, that's think, one of yours, I think, as well. Yeah, it's a oh, piece of me. How do you decide? In zero. Yeah. Um, I think I think certain pieces just lend well to printing. I think yeah. you know I just think of it piece to piece. Um, I like to have just a lot. I have a lot of pieces just around my house. Um, I, I like to think also too is that if it's in, you know, uh, depending on the area of the of, of the house and who's going to see it, I, I try to make it yeah. more. Uh, there's certain pieces that are are more universally. Uh, pleasing, I think, to even non-digital art collectors, and I think this is one of them. Uh, you know, so you know, it's it, it, it depends, but I think it's it's piece to piece for me. Love it, yeah. You have to lead them to to water uh, very thoughtfully. You start with like the the really accessible pieces, and then ultimately bring them into the office layer, and then you can show them the Kim Asinger. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> um, ben, what do you what do you have for us to share? Yeah, let me get this up here. Um, so I'll, I wanted to share this piece called Hollow by Andrew Seamark. And he's a photographer in Western Australia, spends a lot of his time in the ocean, um, this kind of thing. And it's interesting, it's just a personal thing for me where I think he's the first photographer that I really got to know and understand his process. So obviously that illuminates, you know, when you see someone's art and you, you hear them talk about what they've done to get to that piece. It's just so cool. So beyond, you know, I'm a big ocean person, love the water and all that stuff. It's just crazy to hear what goes into creating a, a piece like this or just like capturing a photo like this. Um, yeah. So yeah, just a shout out to him. I love it. Well, it's interesting. You guys both mentioned artists who you, you have some personal relationship with right which does really imbue an artwork and, and something that we collect with this entirely different layer of resonance and understanding and appreciation and it's things like these marfa weekends that art blocks hosts where we get to you know intersect and meet 
our heroes, meet meet these artists, and then ultimately walk away from from those conversations, those collisions with a different appreciation. And you know, in our world where everything is wholly or mostly digital, and we're on crypto Twitter and Discord, um, it, we one could believe that you don't need that in person time. But really, as as we're all talking about, it, it really does drive home the collecting experience in such a deep way. That's the funny part of it is that it's even though you say that, I think one of the strengths of, of this community and, and digital art collecting in general is the community. Um, you yeah. look at the even the fine art, traditional art, they don't have it, there's not the, the community. They are not on discord. They're not on. So this is some of this is the biggest strength I think is really unrealized, to be honest, that we have is the ability to mobilize the ability to have uh these discussions and have these podcasts i think we're much more have much more community than art the art world has ever had before and i don't think that many people we talk talk about that or realize that but something that we need to really start leveraging for sure i think it's a great point i mean um to the outside world we are all outcasts and weird and, and what are those guys doing over there, the women, men and women doing over there in the the NFT crypto world. So um, exactly right. And I think that is actually um, a prerequisite for a very strong, durable movement is to, to have that, that bond and those linkages from doing something that is weird to others or different than others. Um, man, we could chop it up. I feel like all day, this has been a great show. CJ back for round two. Ben, we will have to get you back on the show, of course. Um, and check out Ben, of course, on Twitter. Amazing writer. So much good content there. Also, Ben, your meme game has gotten so good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Thanks, it's gotten man. so good. Um, but this has been a thrill, guys. And uh, let's do it again soon. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Eli. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you.